I loved having this conversation with Mary Frances. Um, I think it was so rich and deep and heartfelt. And I also wanted to give a couple of little disclaimers about it as well. For starters, we explored very sensitive, emotional territory here. So please be kind to yourself while listening. And I was really struck by the tone of the conversation in general, which was so emotional and so heartfelt, even though the lens for it when I first started prepping for this conversation was Mary Frances's work as a neuroscientist and a researcher. And that work absolutely comes through in this conversation. And there are times when we talk about things like sample sizes and trajectories and like normative processes versus uh, people who are more at the tail end one way or the other of the grief experience and regions in the brain that are associated with this experience and all of that. And I understand that for some people talking about it kind of technically in that way can maybe feel a bit dry or insensitive, like we're like we're reducing this incredibly rich and emotional experience down to something that can be represented on a piece of paper in a study. I do think that we mostly avoided that during this conversation, uh, but I totally understand as well if this way of engaging with this topic just isn't for you. And I want to start by saying that's really okay. And if you want to skip this one, I totally understand. Finally, I'd like to let you know about an upcoming offering from Rick that's closely tied to the material that we're going to be talking about today. On August 13 and 14, Rick is going to be teaching a live online two-day workshop on grief and loss. He's going to be exploring different ways of relating to loss and then offering a variety of reparative practices that are focused on healing from these very painful experiences that we all have. And if you like this episode, I think you'll love it. If you'd like to learn more, I've included a link in the description of today's episode. And if you do decide to register for the course, you can use the code BEINGWELL25. That's one word, all caps, being well, and then the numbers two and five to get 25% off. All that said, here's my conversation with Mary Frances. Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. It feels like there is a lot of loss out in the world these days, both in our individual lives and in our broader communities. And with those losses comes grief. There's little more painful than grieving the loss of something you love, and everyone's experience of that process is going to be unique. As you can probably guess if you've listened to the podcast for a while, I'm the kind of person who finds comfort in understanding how something works. I feel like the better I understand something, the more I can do about it. So to help us learn more about our experience of grief, how grief works in the brain, and how we can use that knowledge to help us learn to live with loss, we're joined by one of the world's leading researchers on grief, Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. Mary Frances is a neuroscientist, clinical psychologist, and associate professor of psychology at the University of Arizona, where she directs the Grief, Loss, and Social Stress Lab, which investigates the effects of grief on the brain and the body. She's also the author of the wonderful book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss, which I had a great time reading to prep for this conversation. So Mary Frances, thanks for joining me today. How are you doing? Oh, it's so nice to be here, Forrest. Yeah, I'm really glad that you could do this. It's such a deep topic that you explore both in the book and just in your research more broadly, which I would really recommend to people if they're into that sort of thing, in incredible detail. Um, and I would like to start also with just a little bit of your personal background. There's a line that you're probably very familiar with from research, which is research is me search. And in the book, you talk pretty openly about your relationship with grief tied largely to the loss of your parents. And if you're okay with talking about that, I would love to start there. I think it is really helpful to talk about my own experience, not because it's something I usually do as a scientist, because I think people have a hard time trusting that the things that a scientist is studying is something that they actually also understand in a lived sort of way. So um, as you say, uh, my, my mom was diagnosed with uh, stage four breast cancer when I was 13. And it meant that you know, we lived with the specter of death, I guess, in our house uh, for a long time as I was growing up. But it isn't so much that my research was trying to figure out my own grief, but rather that a combination of I felt really comfortable sitting with people who were grieving, uh, 
Uh, so it, you know, it doesn't bother me if you cry uncontrollably. <laughs> That's just part of, you know, being human. And and it meant that I think I was able to interview people and really dig into understanding what they were saying in a way that then helped me make sense of the, you know, the neuroimages, the the assays that I was doing, perhaps in a different way than someone who hasn't had that experience of of grief would. So my mom died when I was 26. And then about seven years ago, my dad died. And the lived experience of that, it can be different when you know a lot about grief. And that's what I really wanted to communicate to people, that we do know actually a lot about grief now, but that it's not really getting out into the wider public. And that seems a shame to me. If you don't mind me asking, just continuing with your personal experience here for a second, what do you think was it about knowing something about it that changed your experience? Well, when my mom was when my mom was terminally ill, I was actually doing hospice volunteer work and uh that's serious stuff, yeah. Well, and I was a little young. I was, you know, one of the younger volunteers in the area, but it was this sort of comfort with it. At the same time, I still didn't know a lot about grief and I remember I went to see a counselor and I said to her, well, I don't really know that there's anything to say. I mean, she's going to die and what more is there to say? Mm. <laughs> and, you know, decades <laughs> later, here I am still talking it, about it. It so, turned out there was a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> it, turns out, it turns out for all of us, there's a yeah. big learning curve, you know. And so when my dad died seven years ago, it was a very different experience to you know, to be in my 40s than to be in my early 20s, um, just because I knew so much more and I knew myself better. One of the distinctions that you make early on in the, the book, which connects to your experience a bit as well, I'm sure, is this distinction between grief and grieving. I thought it was really useful for me personally. Um, I have somebody really close to me who went through a pretty significant grieving process recently, uh, probably rising to the point of complicated grief, but we can talk about that in a little bit. It was just, it was a very, very intense experience that they're still navigating. Um, and I found that distinction useful. So I was wondering if you could share it here. It came this distinction because of scientific work, because of how would you study this ephemeral thing? Um, but now others have found it useful as well. So the distinction that I'm making here. I think of grief as the natural response to loss. And it's it's a noun, right? It's that feeling and thoughts and just that overwhelm that comes over you. Grieving, on the other hand, is a verb. It's the way that grief changes over time without actually going away. So what I mean by that is grief can come less frequently or less intensely over time. And so that's a change that we see. It can be that even if it's exactly the same, you know, the first hundred times you experience a wave of grief, you think, I'm not even going to get through this moment. This is, what is this? Yeah. And then the hundred and first time you might think, oh my God, this is awful, but it is more familiar you know you're going to get through the moment. You may even have learned how to bring yourself some comfort in that moment. Um, and so this change over time is grieving. And, and that's what that means is, even if it's been a year, even if it's been 10 years since a loved one died, you're going to have moments of grief. You're going to have moments where you are just responding to the fact that this really important person isn't there. And so it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your grieving if you have moments of grief, no matter how long it's been. Is that sort of yeah. distinction helpful? Very much so. The, the difference between an experience and a process to really yes. boil it down yeah, to the core essence, which totally makes sense. And also I think... Um, can be a little freeing for people in a variety of different ways, kind of two different poles of it. On the one hand, people who get, as you said, quite self-critical about still experiencing intense grief even many years after somebody has has passed or after they've lost something important to them, uh, generalizing it out to experiences, moments in time, uh, pets. You know, It doesn't necessarily have to be a person. People can grieve a lot of different things. 
Um, and then alongside that, at the same time, on the other hand, sometimes people might feel like we have an overfocus on the culture in general and recovery and on getting better. And are you trying to take this experience, which has become a very important part of who I am, away from me? Because does that rob me of my relationship with the person who has gone to not experience grief as much? And that can be a very yeah. complicated uh, psychological and emotional relationship that somebody has with that. There's a lot of nuance there. And I think, you know, probably if the thing I would communicate most to people is whatever you're experiencing in grief, it's normal, yeah. <laughs> right? There are very <laughs> few things that are not normal, but it doesn't mean that we can't learn how to manage the fact that you are now a person who will experience intense grief, right? You walk through a door, suddenly you have to learn what it means to have great loss in your life. And that means a lot of different things, different things for different people, but sort of how do you construct a meaningful life along with the fact that you are a person who is carrying the absence of someone or who's carrying the, the possibility of being overwhelmed with waves of grief? You can, it turns out, in time and with support and perhaps some courage, uh, you can build a meaningful life while still carrying this grief experience. Yeah, and that's one of the things that really drew me to the work that you're doing here in general, where it's, I'm trying to find the right way to put this, and maybe you can help me find more precise language for it here. But basically, a lot of the time people frame grief as a, as a process of recovery, yes, but the goal is to feel less grief over time. Whereas the way in general that you frame your work as near as I can tell is much more about, okay, how do we build a fulfilling life? while understanding that this is going to be a part of our experience. And I just think that that framing of it is, uh, I don't know, a lot, it, I just think it's a lot more what people actually do. And it's a lot more exactly. consistent, certainly, with my own experience. Yeah. I think that early on in acute grief, everyone wants to know, when will this end? You know, it's just mm -hmm. so awful. And, and so it's natural to want there to be an end point. But I sometimes use this question, you know, uh, to sort of highlight that there isn't an end point, um, I'll say to people, so when did you get over your wedding day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. Know, which is, what does just, that even mean? Yeah. That's not a question <laughs> that makes any sense, right? Of course, you didn't, there's nothing to get yeah. over. And I think the death of a loved one is very similar. You have a new experience. You have a new understanding of the world. You are now a different person, right? You may be a widow or you may be bereft of, you know, uh, a, a beloved pet or, and so it's a door you walk through, you become this person who understands what it means to have great loss. And you can also have a meaningful life as that person. I think that's great table setting for everything we're going to be talking about for the rest of the episode. So I'm really glad that we started there. And your way into this topic and your expertise is through the lens of neuroscience. What's going on in the brain when someone's either experiencing grief, so we have that experience, or going through the grieving process, this ongoing thing. And knowing what's going on in the brain can help us maybe understand our experiences better, relate to our emotions, maybe even give us a couple of practical tools. And one of the frameworks that you give early on in the book um, for why these emotions are so hard for us to process is based on the brain's map of our world. And I was wondering if you could explain what that means for people. Neuroscience is not the most obvious perspective to take when we're thinking about grief and grieving. But I, I always wanted to understand the why and the how, right? Why is this so painful? And in thinking about the brain, the perspective of the brain, you might say, Essentially, there's a problem to be solved. When we bond with someone, when we fall in love with our baby or we fall in love with our partner or that creation of that bond is registered physically, is encoded physically in the brain. And it's what makes us know, oh, this is, this is my special one and only, right? This, this one right here. Uh, this is the one I'm going to keep coming back to. Or as you described with the map, this is the one that it is vitally important I keep track of. 
Now, that doesn't mean you have to be in their physical presence all the time. So we wouldn't be able to, you know, kiss our children goodbye and let them go to school or, or our partner and each of us go off to work if we didn't have this deep belief and understanding that we'd all be back together again at the end of the day, right? That would be way too terrifying. And so attachment, right, is this invisible tether that assures us that they also will be back. They'll be trying to find us and we're trying to find them if we're apart, if we're separated, so that we can go out and explore our world and then come back together. And the brain has all sorts of neurochemistry that it uses to motivate us, right, to seek out this person and to reward us for being in their presence, right? Uh, So this sense of uh, this is working, my solution to being apart and missing this person is to go get them. Well, there is, of course, this unfortunate and thankfully very rare experience where that solution doesn't work. And the solution to them having died is that they're not actually lost. You can't just use the map to go find them, but rather there is no map. And that is such a disorienting idea for the brain, right? I'm used to them being out of my presence. I know what to do. And that's not working. And so you end up having sort of two streams of information in the brain at the same time. On the one hand, of course, you have the memory. You were at the bedside, right? Or you, uh, you were on the phone. You took a phone call to tell you that this person had died. You have memories. You can say, I know that they've died. And on the other hand, you have this deep abiding belief that you rely on every day that says, they're out there for me. They're my one and only. I can just go find them. And listening to two you know, streams of information that conflict it has a lot of consequences. One, we do really strange yeah. things like we continue to pick up the phone to tell them something funny that happened, even though, of course, we can't call them. Or we think we see them. This is a very common experience that people think I'm losing my mind. They're in a crowd or they're in the movie theater and they think that they see the person who's died. And it's not crazy at all because part of your brain is looking for them, right? If they're not here, I'm just going to keep looking. So it takes a long time to resolve, to learn, to predict their absence instead of predicting their presence. So you just said it right there. The brain's a prediction machine. Like one of its big functions, we look at this with like habitual behavior all the time, is to make good predictions about the world, um, which allows the brain to save energy, make inferences, decide things quickly, all of these very, very useful things. And we had uh, Judd Brewer on the podcast in the past to talk about habit formation. He's a great guy. And um, one of the things that he really talks about in his work is the idea of a prediction error, where you deliberately kind of tell the brain, oh, this is not as rewarding, this experience that I'm trying to break, for instance, of a, a habit I'm trying to end, as I'm predicting it will be, or this experience is more rewarding for a habit that I'm trying to build. And so each time that you bump into that map, to kind of put it this way, your brain's triggering a prediction error. It's going, wait, this person, this thing, this experience is supposed to be here, and it's not, over and over and over again. And that's a very painful process. And also it's part of why the brain just doesn't install a new map, right? We know that habits are very hard to change. So some of the discomfort, some of the suffering that's associated with grief is based on these inaccurate guesses about the nature of the world that, again, are constant because often we're talking about people or experiences or beings that played a huge role in a person's life. So you were bumping into them a lot. Yeah. I think the example that maybe is most visceral to me is Mm -hmm. if you have, you know, slept next to your partner for thousands and thousands of days, when you wake up in the morning on the day after they've died, it is not a good prediction when you turn over and they're not there. It's not a good prediction that they're never coming back, right? That, uh, that doesn't make any sense for your experience, for your prediction. And so it takes many, many days, many weeks and months, and a lot of experience to understand, to predict, ah, this is what it means for my life. 
I can, I can know that this person isn't coming back and it's not going to destroy me to wake up and not have them not there next to me. So nobody has a pleasant experience of this process. Even people who got the perfect Hollywood by the bedside, holding the hand, you're right there with the person. Nobody has a good time here. Um, but some people have a particularly difficult time here where the intensity, the traumatic intensity in particular of grief just keeps going and going and going or even worsens over time. Um, and this is a, a major focus of study for you. It's known as complicated grief. I alluded to it earlier, which occurs basically when somebody is unable to adapt, to, to change, to update that map to the passing of a loved one. Um, and one of the big questions that I want to engage with you here is what tends to lead to these more complicated forms of grief and what really kind of differentiates people who have a painful but smooth adaptation process when they lose something meaningful to them as opposed to those who don't? I think the idea that any adaptation is smooth, just like you said, is just mm. not realistic, is yeah. it? And so, I, I'm glad that you highlighted that for right, starters, which I think well, is you great. Said it yeah. Too. yeah, it's yeah. it's and, and here I think is the crux of yeah. why that we say it that way, because I'll say that too, you know, even though that's not what I mean. And I think this is why, because if you think of that change over time, like I was talking about, for the vast majority of us, there is a decrease in intensity and frequency of these waves of grief. Okay, so over days, months, weeks, years, there is a decrease over time, although it goes up and down, right? We know that anniversaries are terrible for people. Holidays are terrible for people. You may have been doing what felt like you were doing fine. You were adapting, and now suddenly you're in you know, a puddle of tears all the time. And then you realize, oh, it's their birthday this week, right? Or something like that. So even that is not a sort of linear change over time. but the difference, I think, is that people will tell me, this is the worst I have ever felt. And that is absolutely true for them. That it, there is nothing about that that is not true. There's a difference between it being the worst that the individual has felt and looking across as a clinician or as a researcher, being able to look across hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and say, there is also this small group of people who aren't showing change over time. And it's not that their grief is any worse or different in the sense that the moment isn't necessarily different. It's the grieving that is different. It is that they aren't able to restore a life that includes grief, that they're not able to find meaningful activities. They feel like they're just going through the motions is something we hear a lot. And so it can both be true that this is the worst experience you've ever had, and you may not be experiencing complicated grief or what we often now call prolonged grief disorder. So being able to hold those two truths at the same time is a bit of a challenge. And you were asking what predicts it, I think. Well, maybe as a starter question, can we predict it? Like, is this a predictable thing or is the variation here just so individual that there aren't a lot of big picture takeaways in terms of what tends to lead somebody down one path versus the other? Well, one thing for sure is that we have to have some time pass. If grieving is, you have to measure it at more than one time point, then yeah. early on, it's hard to tell. And so it takes a long time to figure out what the trajectory is going to look like. Will this be a more typical uh, change over time? Or will we see just as though it happened yesterday for months and years? And as you said, maybe even get worse. So some of it is that we can't tell at first. But it is also the case there are some predictors. So certainly having had other uh, traumas that are related to attachment. So for example, the death of a, of a caregiver in childhood, uh, having extreme separation anxiety, things that probably mean our attachment system is more sensitive, even our neurobiological attachment system is maybe more sensitive. 
um, history of uh, other types of emotion dysregulation, history of, say, depression, for example, uh, can be um, predictive. Um, and then not having enough social support, it turns out, it is, it, think about if grieving is a form of learning, if you can think of grieving as a form of learning, if we know learning is going to be easier if you have support, right? So it's going to take a long time, but to have someone encouraging you and reassuring you and being able to see a future where you do manage your life, that kind of support helps us stick with the courage to experience our life now. So we know social support, or rather the lack of social support, can really impact developing a more a more complicated or prolonged version of grieving. One of my personal theories, and this is a whole different conversation, is that a big reason that we came up with religion in the first place is to deal with the fear of death. And so I'm curious, do people with a spiritual or religious practice tend to have a, you know, an easier adaptation process than those who don't? There is a study, uh, pretty old study now, actually, but a very elegantly done study that was actually prospective, meaning that they enrolled people before a loved one had died. So the study took like 10 years, right? You interview a whole bunch of couples, essentially, and then you just keep following them. And, and then when one of the members of the couple dies, they were re-interviewed at six months and 18 months and, and so forth. What we know from that is that people who had an understanding of the world that incorporated death in advance. So for many people, that's a religious view, just as you were saying. But for other people, it's a philosophical view or a spiritual view or even sort of an agrarian, you know, the cycle of life kind of view. People who have an understanding of the world that incorporates death do seem to find it easier to incorporate a death that is very meaningful and impactful to them, but it's almost they have a way to fit it into a bigger understanding of life, the universe, and everything. So we do know that. On the other hand, religion has this potential to, it sounds like a funny way to put it, but to backfire. If we believe that we're being punished through this death, uh, that can be very difficult for people to overcome. Or if it causes them to uh, lose their faith in a way that they're not expecting and not accustomed to, to sort of having doubts, um, then that can be problematic for people and can be something that sort of needs to be worked out. So I want to take a second here just to talk about the whole idea that we've been stumbling over through the first, whatever it is, 25 minutes of this conversation or so, which is this idea of a normal grieving process. And I think that sometimes you can learn a lot about a topic just from listening uh, to how smart, educated people talk about it. Like, again, you've done so much work inside of this topic. You've written a book on it. You've published research. You've investigated it for, for most of your professional career. And you're talking very carefully about about these topics. You're you're being you're choosing your words carefully. You're saying this stuff is complicated. You're you're you know you're orbiting it. You're kind of massaging it. And and there's good reason for that. This stuff is really individual and very very personal. And it's like hard to find generalized language about it. So I, I would love to talk about the idea of what normal grief looks like for people or a normal process of grieving. The classic example of this is the five stages of grief, which you have been, I would say, a polite critic of. Uh, and those five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And it comes from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who certainly at the time did just absolutely phenomenal work inside of this territory and was a total trailblazer. Um, but you've written about some of the issues with that model and the difficulties that clear and linear models that generalize our experiences just in general, can create for people here. And I found that really interesting. I think if you think about what she was trying to do, what she was doing, was what all good scientists do at first, was they describe. 
right? They mm-hmm. observe. She actually talked to people about their grief, which, as you say, was just trailblazing work, the idea you could talk to someone <laughs> about what they were feeling. And I think she gave us very rich and deep understanding of grief. It does include depression. It does include mm-hmm. acceptance. It does include denial. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't a description of grieving. Now we have these longitudinal studies where we're able to look at the same person many times over the course of months and and years. And that's not something she had access to. So the difficulty is, if you take the five stages as a description of what grief feels like, I think it's marvelous. If you take it as a prescription for what you should be feeling, that can be damaging because many of us don't experience anger, for example. Or we may experience acceptance and then time passes and suddenly we're really angry again. And those are both normal experiences. Uh, so I, I think that's where the problem comes. And, you know, she was writing in 1969. Think of how far science has come since 1969. We have better models now that maybe focus on aspects of grieving that resonate with people. Yeah. And... I mean, we just love a good linear progression model. Uh, we want You know it. what I mean? We, we love the idea of a straight upward trajectory in yeah. all, all forms and facets of life. And uh, Absolutely. one of the things that I appreciate about what you're doing is that that's, you're just kind of shining a light on the fact that that just is not how this works. Yeah, it's just not. You know, my, even <laughs> my sister's getting married in the fall, and I know that on her wedding day, we're going to have grief. We're going to have real grief that my dad isn't there, that my mom isn't there, that she doesn't know her partner. That's just, I mean, that breaks my heart. There's nothing wrong with the fact that I will have intense sadness on that day, as well as having, you know, enormous joy that my sister getting married. Um, And that to me, that is mental health to me, to be able to, as a, a British uh, grief researcher says, uh, to be able to jump into the puddle of grief and jump out of it again. That that ability to oscillate is mental health in my mind. I love that. I think that's a great framework for it and a, a, great, um, a great way of thinking about emotions in general. And exactly. I think that that covers a lot of the emotional experiences we talk about on the Absolutely. show. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and one of the things that you really emphasize um, later on in the book, when you talk a bit more about what people can do, is the idea of being flexible, where you're going to have times where you feel joy in this process. And then you might feel a little bit of shame for feeling joy when you know that you've lost this person alongside that joy. And then you might feel guilt, and then you might feel anger, and then you might feel perfectly okay while you're eating breakfast. And yeah. that's all okay. And giving yourself it's a pass okay. for that is yeah. a big part of this process, probably. That's absolutely right. A uh, grief yeah. counselor in town says, there's apparently this big book of grief rules that no one can find, <laughs> but they're really important, and yeah. you shouldn't break them. <laughs> mm-hmm. And And people do all sorts of things, you know. My, my father cared for my mom uh, in that last year of her life. You know, she, he was there every day. And, and they'd even been separated for many, many years. And, you know, after she died, he took his wedding ring off. That was the right thing for him to do in that moment. And boy, people really reacted badly to that. You know, as though it's anyone else's business, how you are expressing and experiencing your grief. And and so I think giving ourselves some self-compassion and then if we're sort of grief adjacent, allowing the person to learn whatever it is that they're going to learn. I'm a grief expert and I can't tell you what you're going to learn because you're the expert on you. I may be the expert on the average experience or the variation in experience, but you are the expert on your relationship and how this learning fits into your life now. One of the lines that I've bumped into recently that I've really enjoyed is the idea that an average person doesn't exist. 
And it's one of the issues that you run into in study design, right? Where you're trying to take these long-term views of big groups of people. And in order to do that, part of the goal is to boil all of these big groups of people over a long period of time down into the idea of a quote-unquote average experience. But the problem is that that average experience is a chimera. It is constructed from all of these different bits and pieces of other things. So you get into this weird spot where we're creating a representation of a normal human experience without actually picking any single normal human experience because they are all too unique. And it's an issue in, in social studies research in general, social sciences research in general, I should say. And it's one of the things that the field as a whole is kind of grappling with. And I want to uh, share a line from the book as a way into the next thing I wanted to talk to you about. A disorder shares a fuzzy boundary with normative human difficulties. And it was one of my favorite lines in the book because it is about so many of the things that we talk about on this podcast. And one of your major concerns is that inside of the typical medical model, people have a tendency to pathologize their very normal human experiences, and we have a tendency collectively to want to apply a lot of labels to things, whether we call it complicated grief, prolonged grief disorder, whatever, we're putting a name onto a fairly normal experience when it starts to hit ranges that are maybe a little unusual. And that's kind of fraught. So I was hoping to talk a little bit about that with you in terms of your perspective on that in general and how you balance, A, the desire to help people explain their experience and also get them help if necessary, alongside B, the desire to not pathologize a pretty normal human experience. I talk about this a lot with my clinical graduate students who are becoming clinicians. We talk a lot about uh, what does it mean to have a, a category? What does it mean to have a label? And so there's a couple of distinctions I make because I think this is a really nuanced issue. One is there's a difference between being able to describe this is a particular flavor of experience and we can reliably and validly identify the people who are having this experience. It is one of several flavors of experience you might have after the death of a loved one. That I think is extremely important to be able to do, to say this thing that you're experiencing, it is something other people experience. I recognize it as a clinician and I can even give some suggestions about what you might do to change your flavor of experience, right? All of those I think are good things. There's a separate issue, which is the stigma that comes with the diagnosis. And that is true for all diagnoses, where it doesn't just feel like a different flavor of being, right? Where it feels I am broken and I will never be able to function and, and these sorts of things. I think we have to distinguish those issues. I believe we have to work on the stigma of having a mental disorder or a mental illness or having this other flavor of experience. We have to work on the stigma of that while not ignoring the fact that there are this small proportion of people, one in 10 or less, who experience bereavement that won't experience change over time. And here's the reason ultimately that I think it's important to if people are seeking help, if they are seeking help to be able to identify them. Here's two reasons. One, grief is actually different from depression. And for decades, we've been throwing antidepressants at people who have prolonged grief disorder. I'm glad you're saying this because it was the next thing I wanted to ask you about. So yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we know from some of the research that if you have depression after the death of a loved one, which absolutely can happen, then antidepressants have been, have been shown to help some of those depressive symptoms, but it doesn't help with yearning and yearning for your loved one, sort of that hallmark symptom, that core symptom in prolonged grief disorder. What we also know is that there are frontline psychotherapies, that it doesn't matter if it's been a year or 10 years that people can learn how not to get rid of their grief, but how to live with their grief, how to create a meaningful life while being the kind of person who 
has extreme waves at times. There is a set of skills that in concert with a, a, a therapist who understands what is going on and understands how to give a person courage and motivation and try some experiments in their life, how to help them both deal with jumping in and out of the puddle and also to construct a meaningful life around this experience they're having. So the fact that we can have people who aren't having change over time go through psychotherapy and get back on that more typical trajectory, that to me is a reason to be able to identify them. Not everyone needs that. We don't want to do that for everyone, but there are people for whom we need to be able to do that. Yeah. And I think that's so much of the fraught territory here. And I say this as not a psychiatrist, not a psychotherapist, you know, hold it lightly if you're listening. This is just a guy with an opinion. One of the, part of the fraught territory here has to do specifically with medication um, and the ways in which people, uh, things like the bereavement exclusion for depression and the DSM, which is a whole very complicated topic that I don't want to spend too much time on here. But the basic idea is that um, things were changed to uh, make it so that just losing a loved one no longer excludes you from a depression diagnosis after a really quite short period of time. And that is complicated and fraught. And the idea, as you're saying, Mary Frances, that these are different things, that depression travels with grief, but depression is not grief. And so we can prescribe a medication, and you see this quite frequently, where people try to get prescribed out of their grief experience or their grieving process. Um, And it often does not have a lot of great long-term consequences for them. It can be, and again, this is a very small group of people, but nonetheless, we want to, you know, appreciate their experience that this can be an issue that people bump into. Absolutely. I think the other reason that, (laughs) you know, this sounds, there's working for change within the system and working for change outside the system. And, you know, I'm, I'm usually a within the system kind of person. Yeah credit my British mother, you know, who was sort of like, (laughs) be polite and do social justice, you know. So (laughs) the reason I say it that way is, here's the irony to me. Psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, we have no training in grief whatsoever. Not a single lecture on it. In all of your specialization training, not a single lecture on grief. Now, now that there is something that is atypical, we have to be able to distinguish between the typical terrible suffering that people experience and something that we would refer for psychotherapy. We have to be able to understand what typical grief looks like in order to know if it's not typical. And I believe that the psychoeducation that will have to happen, continuing education, courses in grad school, courses in med school, I believe that that will shift our culture's understanding at a very large level. I also understand that people who are grieving, who've been told that there's something wrong with them for a very long time, are very disheartened to think that someone might formally be able to tell them that there's something wrong with them. I completely Mm. understand that. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful for a world where there's better psychoeducation about grief and grieving and what it looks like and how awful it is while not being a disorder. And I also really, you know, the people who have been studying this for 20 years and trying to come up with the right set of criteria, they do it because every day they see someone who is having a terrible experience and there has previously not been something specific to address them. And so the motivation for the vast majority is very, very pure of simply wanting to help and figure out what's the right way to do it. That point that you made about once something goes into the DSM, to do a little inside baseball here for people, the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's the uh, the the holy book of psychotherapy. It's it's what's used to basically say, hey, what what uh, what bucket does this person fall into, and how can we potentially help this person? Um, once something goes into the DSM, how it's treated in training courses, and how it's treated also 
by the uh, by the medical model is really changes in in some good ways, maybe in some problematic ways. It's a whole complicated soup. Um, but the idea that creating essentially a diagnosis now changes now changes the potential training trajectory for new clinicians or continuing education for clinicians is something I've spent zero minutes thinking about. I literally never thought of that, and that is a super cool idea. I, I mean, uh, yeah, that totally is going to change how I think about that. Um, so thanks for thanks for sharing that. That's really interesting. I'd never really heard somebody put it that way. You know, it's interesting. I teach uh, what we call our advanced psychopathology class uh, in at the University of Arizona for our clinical graduate students. So we go through the major disorders you're likely to see, etiology, maintenance, prognostic factors, all that, you know. And I do it for grief. And the fact that you can think about the question that you had, what, what causes or what predicts someone who's not going to do as well? I want a clinician to know that, right? Yeah, a- totally. absolutely. When they're seeing yeah. everybody, I want them to understand how is grief impacting what you're seeing in the office. So I do think that's valuable. And I would just also point out, not a lot of people seem to n- know this um, when I read about it in the newspaper. Uh, the International Classification of Diagnoses, the ICD, uh, came out a few years ago with what they call the ICD-11. They're up to number 11. The ICD is put out by the World Health Organization. And international body. It also recognizes prolonged grief disorder and did so s- several years before the DSM sort of finally joined on and uh, came into line with the WHO's recommendations about treatment. So uh, so just, you know, it's not only the crazy Americans doing it, yeah. I guess it's my main point here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I found that really personally interesting because I'm way in the weeds on this stuff, but I would love to kind of broaden the lens out a little bit again um, and spend some time talking about your neuroimaging work and the research that you've done actually on the brain. And I would love it if you could give a very summary, very summary overview here of what's actually going on in the brain when somebody experiences grief, both based on the original studies that you did back in 2003, I think it was, and also what we've learned since then. So that first study, that was the very first study where they ever put, we ever put bereaved people in a scanner and said, I wonder what the brain is doing when someone is looking at a picture of their loved one and feeling that wave of grief. And boy, have we come a long way since then, which I am delighted to be able to say. Um, That first study really drove home for me how complex grieving is, how complex grief is, even in the moment, so that there are many regions of the brain that are involved. It's not a singular, you know, there's no grief blob somewhere lurking. Uh, But, you know, it involves parts of the brain that are related to memory, that are related to uh, being able to take someone's perspective, uh, that are related to the significance, the salience of the suffering that someone's experiencing, emotion regulation, blah, blah, blah. So lots of regions involved. But the first study was really, you know, like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, was really a description of what's happening. Yeah. And what's more important in science is usually to have a theoretical reason that you're asking a question. So the next study was a study that I did looking at the difference between people who are adapting well and the people who have a more complicated grief um, experience. And something that was very interesting about that was there was a region of the brain that was showing a difference between these two groups of people. And it's called the nucleus accumbens for your brain area junkies out there. (laughs) What's important about it is it was people who were experiencing more complicated grief who were showing activation in this region when they were looking at the photo of a loved one who had died. What's unusual and unexpected about that is it is considered a reward area of the brain. And so you think, wait, the people who aren't doing as well are experiencing this reward area. What is going on? It took me a long time to think about what was going on there. But this is, I think, how I interpret that now. Based on other studies that have been done, including animal studies and so forth, remember how we were talking about updating. You have to update your understanding of the world. Well, when we are in a relationship with a living loved one, 
seeing a picture of them is a prediction. Oh my gosh, I'm going to see them. It's going to be great. I love seeing them. I love, look at their face. They're so lovely. And for people who were having a harder time adapting, it may be an interpretation that they were still having that experience. Yeah, the yearning never went away. That's yeah. right. Or the that, intensity of it never went away. Exactly. Or, that that whatever, yearning yeah. for that reward was being mm-hmm. demonstrated there, that wanting, basically, which is a part of reward. And for people who were adapting more resiliently, we saw lots of memory areas, emotion regulation areas, right? There were lots of other areas that were activated, but perhaps in a way they had updated and they knew, no, this, this doesn't predict that I'm going to see them again. And so not having that same sort of bond response to this photo. Now, that's a lot of conjecture. I'm going to say we're taking a really small piece of data from a fairly small study and making a lot of assumptions. It does have to do with other studies that have come out. But even in the last two years, even since the book was written, we have more studies that are coming out. I never saw any amygdala activation, for example, in any of the studies that I had done to date. And now there's several studies that are showing amygdala activation around what appears to be sort of intrusive thoughts and emotion regulation. So there's lots to be done. I'm delighted to say I am no longer the grief researcher. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that there is a critical mass of us, right, that are studying this and talking yeah. to each other and coming up with different ideas. Uh, my understanding is that the experience when somebody is in grief in the brain is a pretty distributed system, that there are a lot of different parts of the brain that are lighting up when this is going on that serve a lot of different functions, which is a fancy way of saying this stuff is complicated and it makes sense why our emotions around it are also very complicated. That's right. A lot of different things fits into grief. Yeah. I would like to take the rest of the conversation to talk a little bit more on what people can take away from this practically, whether they're going through a grieving process themselves, they're seeing somebody else who's close to them going through this process, and maybe they want to be able to offer something. And one way into talking about this is just how we approach thinking about the recovery process altogether. And kind of in contrast to the conventional five stages of grief, you just get better and better and better over time. There's this other model called the dual process model that you share in the book. And would you mind telling us a bit more about that? This was very much a reaction as new scientific theories are often a reaction to what came before. It was put out by Maggie Strova and Hank Schutt, Uh, from the Netherlands, wonderful people who I have spent many good conversation hours with. Mm. The dual process model says, look, there are really two kinds of stressors that bereaved people have to deal with. On the one hand, there's what we think of as the loss-related stressors. This is what we traditionally think of when we're thinking of grief. It's the overwhelming feelings, the intrusive thoughts, the even just being able to sort of put it out of your mind, all of those things. But there's another set of stressors, which they term the restoration stressors. And this is what I think of as, how do I restore a meaningful life now that this has happened? And that's everything from how do I remember not to buy their favorite cereal in the grocery store, all the way to, I've never... I've never uh, pumped gas before or, or done a checkbook or, uh, you know, I don't know how to make a dinner reservation because, you know, my socializing was always sort of very deeply ingrained with my partner. So all of those things that you have to now figure out how to do and be in the world, those are the restoration stressors. But what was so wonderful about this model is that Strobe and Schutt talked about the oscillation, that you don't just deal with one set of stressors or the other set, but rather throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the months and years, you're really oscillating between dealing with one set of stressors and dealing with the other. And, and again, you see that flexibility rear up, right? The ability to, in the morning, be, you know, trying to put a uh, uh, trying to put a bid on a new house because you're moving and, you know, you're That's all you're thinking about, right? You're just focused on this future situation. And then in the afternoon, you're looking through your photo album, right? Of your wedding and having a good cry. And so this capacity to sort of do both and also outside of those two stressors, 
have some everyday life, right? It's perfectly acceptable to, I use this example of, you know, you're at your daughter's soccer game and you're just like, I'm going to put this out of my head, not going to think about it, going to pretend this never happened. I'm focused right now on cheering for my daughter. That's all I'm going to think about. And that's okay too, right? Having some of everyday life. Over time, the loss-related stressors and restoration-related stressors become less and less frequent because you do learn, right? You do adapt and develop this life around the loss that you've had. And so more everyday life experiences is sort of more of your day. That's the newer model. Yeah. And we've spent a lot of time on the podcast um, telling people, giving, giving general advice, things like, in general... If you avoid your emotions, if you push them down inside of you, if you suppress them, they intensify over time, they get worse, we need to address our feelings, we need to experience them out, so on and so on and so on. And what I like about a lot of what you're saying here and about the dual process model in general is that it highlights that like sometimes it's okay to deny something, sometimes it's okay to distract yourself, sometimes it's okay to be a little avoidant. Um, my partner, Elizabeth, who's in training to be a somatic psychologist right now, she's earning her hours towards licensure. Um, one of the things, yeah, I know, very exciting. Uh, one of the things that she says sometimes is, look, disassociation is a protective mechanism. It's got its uses sometimes. So, you know, just and, and validating people's experience in that way. One of the things that I see in people, and I would love your take on this, is a lot of shame if they stop feeling bad. If they have the moment where they stop thinking about it, they go, oh my God, how could I ever stop thinking about this thing that is such a central part of my life now? That's right. And that's part of the grief. There will be times when you're not thinking about it. And that's a piece of grief, you know, and it's okay to feel awful about that and learn how to live with that as well, you know? And, you know, this is just as you say, this is the big book of grief rules again, isn't it? I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think our judging of ourselves and our experience and each other's experience is so dominant in what we're doing. I think one of the hardest things that I see, and I try to remind people, the experience of grief, it's not the same as the expression of grief. So we often see in families where people are expressing grief very differently. And there is an assumption on someone's part, well, do they not really care? They're not even, you know, I don't even see them cry. They don't want to talk about it. And for some people, it's a very internal experience. And that's okay, too. They don't have a worse outcome, necessarily. So it really is about what's working for you and what's working for you in the moment, and then trying something new if things aren't working. Yeah. Are there... You mentioned earlier that there are specific therapeutic interventions that people can do if they are in that world of complicated grief or prolonged grief. And also, frankly, for people who are going through a uh, perfectly middle of the distribution grieving process, which also really sucks. Understandably, it is deeply painful and the pain is very understandable. And they want to do what they can to ease their experience of it. Um, what are some of these therapeutic interventions that people can do? And maybe are there a few specific practices or specific ways of thinking that you've seen really positively improve people's experience? I would say, first off, you know, I say this in the book as well, but I'm just not one to give advice. <laughs> So I like to lay out the platter of things that have been helpful to other people. And if there's something that appeals to you, pick it up off the platter, right? Love but that. don't Great. assume, you know, just because I'm saying it doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, having said that, I, I will make a slight distinction here, which is that uh, prolonged grief therapy is very specific and has some very specific, not only skills that it teaches, but ways that the uh, clinician is engaging to support the person. So for example, uh, there's an exposure, an exposure portion usually to this type of treatment where the person recounts how the death happened and then they tape record that and they listen to it again and again. And you can see how deeply difficult that would be and can often be best when done in the supportive relationship with a, a therapist who understands where this person is at. So I do make some distinctions between things we would do very specifically for someone who is in therapy for prolonged grief treatment. And I will say the prolonged grief uh, center at Columbia University 
if any of your review, uh, re- listeners are interested, is a great thing to Google, both for the public and professionals. On the other hand, there are things that we know, patterns of thoughts and behaviors that do sometimes get in the way. So back to this idea that grieving is a form of learning and it takes experience to learn, many of us have something we're avoiding, whether that's a conversation we're avoiding, a person we're avoiding, a situation we're avoiding, and It is often something then, by avoiding it, that prolongs our experience of it. Just as you were saying, it is often better to just jump in, especially with support, if you can elicit support from people around you. I'm going to try this thing. I don't think it's going to be great, but I'm going to do it anyway. Many people find that very helpful. I'll give you an example to make it a little more concrete. Yeah, please. Someone who's widowed they will often say, I'm not going to go out to dinner with our friends. You know, yeah, we totally used to enjoy that. It was one of my favorite things. I'm just not going to do it now that he's gone. I, it would just, I'd be upset the whole time. I'd feel like a fifth it would bring wheel, up the painful thoughts and feelings. Exactly. Absolutely. They're going to feel awkward. I'm going to feel awkward. Mm-hmm. We're just going to talk about it the whole time. All exactly. Of that. Yeah. So it can be better to strategize, right? Have a have a comrade in this who you say, okay, I'm going to try this. I used to enjoy it. it used to be meaningful. Um, will you get me out of there if it's not going well? Or will you help me stay in if it's not going well? Whatever you, you feel like support looks like. And here's the key. It is going to be terrible the first time. <laughs> you know, I hate to say it, but it, it is a slow upward spiral. So here's what happens. So you go out to dinner. It's not great. It's not as bad maybe as you thought, but it's not great. So you do it again. And it's not great. (laughs) You come home and you think, what am I doing? And then you go out the third time and it's not great. But, you know, you'd never had the lobster before. And it was actually pretty tasty, (laughs) you know. (laughs) And over time, there's this upward spiral of, oh, and then someone told me about this book I didn't know about, and I'm going to look it up because that's really interesting. And you would never have had that conversation, right? So it's a slow upward spiral, but it doesn't feel good at first. But the avoiding means you never get to have the lobster and you never get to have the conversation about the book if you keep avoiding. And one of the things that I maybe just want to leave people with toward the end here One of the ideas from the book that's, it's just a line that really stuck with me is the idea that grief essentially is an expression of love, that we feel grief because we felt a lot of love. Like these things are intimately correlated with one another. And so it's understandable why people can form the the conceptual model that less grief means less love. That if I stop having as traumatic an experience of grief in the moment, that means that I am losing this person in some way. And the grief is probably not something that's going to go away. But we can see that grieving process as something where maybe there's a chance to bring a fulfilling life in alongside the presence of that painful experience. So just because you're taking a moment for yourself, you're going out to dinner with the friends and family, it doesn't mean that you love the person any less. Just because you feel a little bit better today than you did yesterday doesn't mean that you love the thing any less or the individual or the being any less. And I think that that's what I really appreciate about your work in general, how it's really framed emotionally and how it's framed in terms of uh, people's deep and meaningful relationships with each other and the inevitable joys and sorrows that come out of those relationships. You know, there's a lot of data that we've been talking about, and I talk about the brain a lot. But for me, there is comfort in it as well, which is is not data-driven, but is the way I interpret it, which is that when you fall in love with someone, it changes your brain. Because of this person, your brain is different. And even though they're no longer alive, you still carry them physically with you. And so for me, there's a piece of You learn to live with the grief, but hopefully also with enough time, support, experience, and love, you come back to understanding that feeling of love, that caring that I provided, that I learned how to do because I was loved by them and I learned how to love. You can do that for anyone, and it can be an expression of the love that you learned with your one and only. 
you still get to bring that to the world. And that to me is, is simply the, you know, that's the wonder of the brain that we're able to remember and, and do these loving things in honor of the person as well. Mm. Mary Frances, thanks so much for doing this with me today. I had a great time talking with you. I feel like I learned a lot personally. And uh, it was just a really lovely conversation. So thank you. I really enjoyed it, Forrest. This was a great, this was a great conversation. I want to start by saying that I loved this conversation. I loved how many topics we were able to cover. I loved the tone of it throughout. And I love the deep care that Mary Frances clearly has for people's experience of this sensitive, tender, difficult territory. And I think that it really subverts, frankly, the common view that people have of academics or researchers or scientists in general of trying to distill complex, difficult emotional experiences down to their component parts so that they can be, I don't know, measured in a test tube or something. And that's part of why I was glad that we started with her personal story and her own relationship to grief and loss. And her experience of it largely came through the loss of her parents, her mother when she was fairly young and her father more recently. And we started by offering a distinction between grief and grieving that was really useful for me personally. Grief is an experience, an intense, overwhelming emotional experience. It's a moment that occurs over and over and over. And it generally doesn't end for people because it is an understandable response to the loss of something that was very important to you. Even after you have fully accepted that something has ended, and even after you've adapted to it to a degree, you'll still have those moments, probably for most people, where you feel overwhelmed by emotion. Grieving, on the other hand, is a process, specifically that process of adaptation to the passing of something. It is critically a process of learning where our old mental models are updated with new information. This learning is slow. This learning is fraught. This learning is hard. This learning changes for different people based on their unique experience of the world. But for most people, there is a process of adaptation where things don't necessarily get good, but they do get better over time. And then there are some people, uh, Mary Frances said about one in 10 people who go through a bereavement experience who don't really adapt much over time. Maybe their experience even gets worse as time goes on. And this took us into a conversation about complicated grief and prolonged grief disorder. And alongside it, the whole complicated, nuanced conversation attached to the idea of a normal human experience becoming abnormal in some way, which is when it starts to get the language and the label of being a disorder. And there are, frankly, nuances and specificities here that I don't feel equipped to give a opinion on. I, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, so I want to be really careful about offering anything that appears like my own view. All I know is that this is really complicated territory. What I can say with some degree of confidence is that two things are true at the same time. On the one hand, we absolutely want to be able to provide support and service and methods and treatment to people who are having a really difficult time emotionally and psychologically with any experience that they're having. Of course, that's just a good thing. Then on the other hand, we don't want to pathologize normal range experiences and normal human experiences that people are going through. And one of the issues that the field has had here in the past is the intertwining of depression diagnoses with grief. Grief and depression are two different things. And yes, people can experience depression alongside grief. And when they do, they are sometimes benefited by the addition of medication or the taking on of therapeutic practices that are specifically designed to treat depression. But what has also happened in the past is that people have been frankly misdiagnosed as depressed when they are just going through a perfectly normal grief process. And that has led to real problems. Something that Mary Frances returned to over and over throughout the conversation was the idea of normalizing this process in general. And also, 
normalizing the variation in it. Everyone's process is going to be different here. And I think it's really tempting for us to look for a linear progression when there is none to be found in psychology and life out in the world all over the place. And there are models like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's model of the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, that were certainly really useful at the time. But as time has gone on and our understanding of these things has developed, we can gain a greater, we've gained a greater appreciation for how individual these processes are and how they include backsliding and they include a lot of wandering in the wilderness and how maybe some people don't feel anger at all or maybe some people don't feel depression at all like I was talking about earlier or maybe some people find acceptance and then three weeks later they're thrust back into denial. And a huge current that ran underneath this conversation that I'm not sure that I ever named overtly and I kind of wish that I had is self-compassion. Giving yourself a break for the intense and painful emotions that come up during a normal, natural, perfectly typical, and also completely unique grief process. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. I had a great time talking with Mary Frances. And again, her book is The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. I'd really appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it right now. It really helps us out. And you can also leave a rating and a positive review. Or hey, maybe tell a friend about it. It's probably the best way that we have to reach new people. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. One of the things that I provide on the Patreon are these expanded notes that go into the research and talk about the topics that we explore during the episode in more detail. Um, and I'm sure that the notes for this episode are going to be a bear to put together. So I hope that people come and join us on Patreon again, patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. Finally, quick reminder about Rick's upcoming workshop on grief and loss. It's August 13th and 14th, and you can find a link to that in the description of today's episode. Thanks again for joining us today, and we'll talk to you soon.